Hello and welcome to Handgun Radio. I'm your host, Ryan Machat from the wild woods of central Maine, and this is your home for all the news, information, and discussion in the handgunning world. This week, we chat with our friend Shan from Works Holsters about their new products and more. So as always, Handgun Radio is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network, and please check out the Patriot Patch Company for their awesome patches and other high-quality items. Visit patriotpatch.co for more information. And as always, shop Amazon using our affiliate link, firearmsradio.tv slash Amazon. And please help support Handgun Radio. Head over to firearmsradio.tv slash pledge and click on HGR. There are a bunch of different pledge levels over there, and we really appreciate it. So uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, Shan, it has been a while since we've had you on the show. Goodness, it's got to be years and years. I think it's been about a year and a half or so. Been way too long. Yeah, absolutely. Good to have you back. And uh, Weird, as always, how you doing? How you doing, Ryan? Oh, not bad. So uh, we have a really interesting main topic here. There's a bunch of them from looking at the show notes. I'm like, oh, man, this is going to be fantastic. So uh, Weird, what did you do this week? I uh, well, I was going to go to the range, but I the plague has hit Weird World. My daughter was really, really sick a few weeks ago, and now my wife and I are really, really sick, and she's doing much better. And so it's one of those like, oh, I think I'm feeling better. And then just start hacking and coughing. And I'm still hacking and coughing. And by the way, for those of you who use Google Hangouts, if you use the little mute button as a cough button, Google Hangouts will go, you know, your mute button's on. Yeah, I'm coughing. <laughs> but I, I also had my, uh, my nephew over. He, was, he took a flight out of, uh, out of Logan uh, this weekend. And uh, so he came and spent, uh, spent, a night with, uh, spent a day with us and... Uh, we, uh, I was planning on going to the range, but he ended up like he left work like late that night and like took a bus down and was just absolutely exhausted. And it was all for the best. You don't want someone that's half asleep out on, out on the shooting range. So we mostly just chilled out and did spend a little bit of time kicking tires down in the armory. Mostly he had a lot of, he's a new shooter. So had a lot of like technical questions like, oh, what's the difference between locked breach and blowback? And what does this do and that do and the different types of actions? So we, we got we got we got a little gun handling time, not a lot of range time. Why does your P sixty four have such a terrible trigger pull? Oh God, he, yeah, I did that. I did the P sixty four. He was like, "Oh my God, yeah, isn't that great?" <laughs> that thing is ridiculous. You, uh, you ever what? shot one, Shan? No, I have not. Oh, it's great. It's got I be, my my P sixty four. I've heard. I've heard, I, I got angry at one YouTuber for saying that, oh, the double action's terrible. The single action's pretty nice. And then uh, Tim from Military Arms Channel also said the exact same thing about a P64 he handled. I've only handled two, and they were identical as far as I could tell. But yeah, uh, but Tim said, Tim said, oh yeah, no, the trigger's actually not bad on mine. And I went, really? Well, I'm going to believe Tim. So maybe there are some that have good you know quote unquote good triggers but mine has got the worst trigger ever and the first one i shot had the had a terrible trigger and it is like oh they're about of like 15 to 18 pounds double action and it's a gritty sludgy awful double action trigger pull and then it's like four pounds single action but it's also like the most creepy grindy awful single action trigger ever and those two and put together is just comic relief well, and you expect like not a great trigger pull from a surplus gun, but this even exceeds that. Oh yeah, I mean, I've I've got a whole bunch of com block stuff, and none of them are what you would call polished. So, Shan, what'd you do this week? <laughs> oh boy, nothing quite so exciting. No, no range time, even though my backyard is my range. Uh, oh, but I envy. didn't. I, <laughs> I might have got some range time in there if it didn't involve me like lugging range bags like to the car and then driving and lugging them out to the out, out to the shooting range while hacking and coughing. I probably could have managed to step out my back porch with a gun. Yeah, we've got we've got 40 acres here in Idaho, so it's uh we can we can do what we want here including long gun stuff. Do, but... do you have a mule? No mule, but I do have a tractor. How, how can you get 40 acres and not a mule? You've <laughs> got to have it just for the just for the joke. It just rolls off the tongue so well. <laughs> just chickens. And I, I certainly ain't going to I ain't going to ride one of those. <laughs> are you going to get me coughing again? <laughs> are you a visual uh, visual listener? Yes. 
<laughs> no, I, you know, I did manage to pick up, a, finally picked up an XCS 3.3 and 9mm this week. Uh, decent looking little pistol, but, you know, I, I, given the business we're in, I pick these up so that we can go ahead and, and build the, the right holster for people and that we can actually do tests of the most popular pistols, the actual test test that actual pistol in their holster um, before we ship it out to them. So picked up that XDS and I've also recently built a P80 frame up uh, um, Glock 19 polymer 80 frame, which after building that, I'm not the biggest fan of the build quality of those, but uh, uh, it is what it is. And there's a lot of people out there running them. So we, we have one in the safe as well. Now that's interesting because we just had the show on that. So, what were some of your concerns? It uh, it just doesn't feel smooth and proper, and it might be my rushed build to go ahead and get it out and available. But it just doesn't the assembly on it just doesn't feel. It's here. I grabbed it, and it's it's still not quite going into. all the way back into into battery on, on its own. So that's that's where it's at for me. And uh but that said, I'm not gonna run it and uh we are going to use it to to build holsters for. So uh weird, uh this week you heard me talking about this, my grips earlier. I've been making some wood grips for the model nineteen. Yeah, they're really cool. <laughs> yeah. tell, tell the listeners yeah. more. Well, they look like they've been chewed apart by a rodent. That's kind of what they look like. Um, uh, I need to work on my file skills. I haven't used a hand file in a long time. Well, to, to use scientific terminology, what you've got there is a proof of concept. You you just decided, hey, let me see if I can do this, and I'm just going to try to do it. That's for that for, for that sort of idea as a proof of concept. You've proven the concept. You you can yeah, you I'm can make pistol grips. I'm very oh, happy with works. it. I need to work on them a little bit more. They need to be more rounded, but I'm someone who doesn't like the huge, big, like revolver grips on there. I like the narrow mm -hmm. ones and this is on a square butt. So it needs to be a little bit flared out at the bottom, but so far I did it with softwood first. So I started with, um, with just like a cheap pine board and I traced it out and then I used a, uh, a specific drill bit on the drill press to kind of chew out and inlet the area where it needs to meet up with the frame to get it as close as possible. And now I'm basically just work on working on thinning it down and then using the hand file to get the right angles around the grip and then sanding it down as I do that. And, you know, then I'll put them on the gun. I'll see how it feels. If they're too thick, I'll sand them down some more, but I'm doing it with that soft cheap wood now. And I have a nice piece of maple and I'm hoping to find some walnut, if any listeners know where there's good places to find like b walnut boards, like small ones, let me know because I can't find any around here. And Home Depot and Lowe's don't carry any walnut. So, so if you're looking for custom grips on your high point, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm your man. Uh, yeah, so th that's been going along. And then uh, I spent some time shooting a Henry Golden Boy 22 long rifle, and that thing is awesome. And now I want one. Lever action rifles that are that smooth are fantastic. Yeah, I keep trying to try to get convince my wife to ask me to buy one because I'm actually not the hugest fan of lever actions, but also at the same time, it's one of like the classic actions. Uh, so it'd be nice to have one, but it's not something I'm super duper interested in. But my wife loves lever actions. The few times she's gotten a chance to shoot them, she's in love with them. I'm like, I could get one. Just say the word. Just, come just, on. Yeah. Come on. I'm I'm baiting you in, please. There will be a video that'll be up once the show uh, by the time this show is posted of me shooting the rifle and it is fantastic. It's addictive. Uh the only pain is when you have to load the tube mag. Cuz it's just so much fun to shoot. Yeah, but those tube mags are fairly easy to load. You're just dropping them in. Yeah. And then finally, uh much to your chagrin, weird. I shot Dad's Kimber nine millimeter more this weekend, and it functioned fantastic. Again, no, no chagrin whatsoever. <laughs> like, I, I have just, as far as companies go, even though both of them are 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 uh, Ronnie Cohen uh, uh, endeavors, 
I've just I've heard so much more about Sig Sauer's reliability and qu- and build quality over Kimber. But let me tell you again, if Kimber started making guns, you know, as good as they were claiming them to be, or as good as the, the you know the Kimber fanboy that comes on to every group talks about, oh my Kimber runs beautifully and all that is that of course they make some that run perfectly. I've shot Tauruses that run beautifully. And if Taurus started making guns that worked beautifully, I'd be nothing but happier. If Remington started making guns that were awesome, I'm not a hater for the sake of hating. I just, I just once you burn me, I'm not going to trust you very well. And so I, I'm, I think it's awesome that your dad's Kimber works awesome, especially it's got the laser on it and all that. I think that's great. Yeah, well, that's the thing. The laser died. Did the laser die? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm pretty sure it just needs a new battery. I, I think maybe he might have like left the switch on and it somehow in the case the button got activated and it just drained it that could happen so i just gotta put a new battery in it how, how are what's the battery situation on those it's a, like one of those cr one two three little dime nickel battery things yep and then and you have to take the whole grips off and i honestly don't know i haven't done it yet I, you, i'm you, assuming de- definitely that's something for future shows is like especially if you like accidentally leave the you know, leave the, you know, the bat, the, the switch on or something happens and the battery ends up draining dead. And then you end up having to take the whole thing off, take that, take, take the battery out, replace the battery and then re zero it. That would be, uh, that would be unsettling. I, I, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know if Shan has any experience, but I don't think leaving the switch on causes any drain on the battery life. I do think though, there, there may have been some way that the bat, the activation button well, that's that's the whole point of the switch is is not is is not to save battery life because yeah, there might be electrical engineers would have to chime in on this one. There might be a little bit of a drain for the switch being on versus the switch being completely off, but I think it's negligible. But the big issue is that with that little switch turned off, you're not going to set it down, you know, on something and have it rest up against the activation button and turn the laser on all night long. Right. Well, which which Kimber is this? Is this uh, their the micro solo? nine millimeter? Oh, the micro. Yep. Yeah, I mean yeah, it shoots I have, great. Um, I I haven't actually used, you know, needed to use those with that uh, with those grip lasers because we just clearance for those uh, when people have them. Right. So weird. What was your drink segment this week? So I've been playing around more. I think it was last week. I I did a, uh, was it last week? I'm not trying to remember, but I'm doing a, a, PBR. Oh, I did talk about PBR. That's right. I I'm kind of messing around with blood and sand see. I did the uh, version with, um, with, uh, Meyer lemon juice instead of orange juice. Cause the Meyer lemons are a little sweeter than traditional lemons. And you know, it's, it's good. And I had, uh, I was actually on geeks, gadgets and guns. And I used the last little Meyer lemon juice with the ratio I'm going to be talking about right now. And it was pretty darn good, but I was like, I wonder if the slightly tartar regular lemons would work. And while I was thinking about that, I couldn't leave well enough alone. I said, you know what? Everyone, you know, Grant got really upset at me for, for using, for using scotch, even blended scotch in a cocktail. So I said, you know what? I'm actually going to try rye because rye's got some comparative properties to to uh, to like a blended scotch, as far as you know, it's a little bit spicier. It's got a little bit of a drier note than the say more sweet sweetness of bourbon. And so, I did. Uh, I used. Uh, I used. Bu- I used bullet rye. Uh, I used uh, two ounces of bullet rye, three quarters an ounce of lemon juice, just regular lemon juice, three quarters ounce cherry brandy, three quarters ounce of sweet vermouth. And it is good, not perfect. I think it does need the scotch. I think it needs that little bit of richness that the scotch adds to, because there's a lot going on with, especially that the cherry brandy and the sweet vermouth together. Those are some big and bold flavors. And I think the scotch will cut through them a little bit better. So more on that later, man. I can get another drink segment out of the same damn drink. Nice. And I like the return to the, uh, the whiskey drinks. Yeah, well, it's none of this cold fancy drinks. stuff with an egg that you have to whip and all this other stuff you've been doing. Eggs are delicious, man. Eggs are so good. You're so pretentious, weird. I am super duper pretentious. <laughs> Every, everyone knows me. That's the first thing they say. They, they, no, the first thing they say is he's uncomfortably good looking. The second <laughs> thing they say is he's pretentious about it. 
<laughs> All right. So with that uh, dubious factual information, we will head into the main topic. Works holsters redux. So, uh, Shannon, it's been a while since we had you on. Uh, what is new with Works Holsters? Well, you know, the the move to call or move to Idaho from Colorado has been a blessing. I mean, yeah, it's been a couple of years since we talked, but uh, you know, we continue to get more and more integrated with the community, and we we continue to grow as a business. That's that's been a blessing for myself and my family, and hopefully for some of the people in the community. And then, you know, from on the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling basis, we continue to, to grow our selection. Uh, we've got over 170 different pistol molds. We've got just racks and racks of them and, uh, and like 45 different lasers. And we, we still, I, as a matter of fact, I'm looking at a bunch that I still haven't even put up on the website. So we're always adding, always expanding our capability for building custom holsters for folks. And then, uh, got some new products that we'll talk about a little bit later but uh no it's it's been awesome with it's wonderful here in idaho and uh we've got great customers all across the country and that's you know every day i get to interact with them is a blessing so for people that haven't listened to the shows we've done before together um you don't actually really use i mean you use some blue guns but you like to have the actual firearm for your holster molds right uh, I use I use a bunch of molds uh, since you know we're talking 100 of them. I don't have that many pistols in the safe. Uh, I like to I like to have them for the most popular pistols, and we talked about the Paul Moretti earlier and a few other ones. Yeah, I mean I I continue to expand our capabilities, but when it comes to molding on something, using a a mold such as the blue gun or one of the other commercial molds really does save me time, and it also um, it, it's also, uh, I prefer just to do the, the final check with the actual pistol. Yeah, that, that really probably gives you a better, a better idea of, I mean, cause yeah, blue guns are great, but I'm sure there might be a little bit of variation. There, there is always variation and, and frankly, the, just the surface finish difference makes a, makes a different feel for the holster. So, um, we like to use the the roll pistols where we can, and uh, you know that's that's one of the reasons why I picked up that XDS this last week, so that we can we can make sure that that gets tested as well. What are some of the challenges that you guys have encountered since we last talked? Well, I, most people running a small business know that time is always the the scarce commodity. Uh, you know, I've been a I've been a busy boy, and I'm still you know I think I make progress every day. But when I look at the stuff that there is to do, that's um, it's a big list. I've got to I've got to finish our new website, and once that's done, we'll have a bunch more configuration options for people. I want people to be able to pick pick out the the type of kydex that they want for front and rear and all that. Be able to to really get even more detailed in their customization of, of the holster that we build for them. Um, I mentioned that I don't even have up some of the lights and lasers and pistols that we have available. Um, I need to create an automated way for me to, <laughs> to, to put that in on the website and make it go across all the products that it applies to. So that's more work I got to do. And then, uh, and then the new products that we've been building, um, trying to get those done so times times number one uh we've been blessed to sell a whole lot on amazon but amazon's a double-edged sword it uh you know all the customers there are their customers and uh, uh they are very generous on returns and if there is a return i don't have quite the visibility into okay why did a customer return it did they pick the wrong thing um you know, by the way, like the Gen 5 Glock are actually different from a holster perspective than the Gen 4 and Gen 3. So did they pick the wrong thing? Did they, you know, is there a problem with the holster that I need to address? Whatever. So I've always kind of wondered that because like my wife and I, I mean, my wife goes on Amazon all the time and I always, we had to return a couple things and I was always wondering like, how does that work from like the manufacturer, the distributor's perspective? And that is interesting to hear from you. 
Yeah, I mean the and every time something gets returned, we we lose money on it and and so I really would like to minimize those returns. You know, it's, it's I think a lot of people don't understand when somebody like us or many of the people send product to Amazon, um, Amazon's the one that ships it out. It goes out from their warehouse. That's how they do prime deals. And, uh, um, you know, people right. will email and they'll be like, hey, you didn't send my holster fast enough. And I'll be like, I'm sorry, but that's Amazon's deal. <laughs> Need to talk to them. Number one, your your my experience here shipping is extremely fast. And number two, in my experience, if something is wrong with a holster that you've sent somebody, you're more than willing to fix it for them. Absolutely. You know what? We're we're here at the pleasure of our customers. We've got to serve them. If we don't serve them, then uh, then what are we here for, right? But yeah, it's. Um, and, and people spend their hard-earned money on, on our products, and I want them to be to go away feeling good about it. And if there's in the rare occasion that we can't resolve an issue, I'll just refund everybody, you know, people's money. I, this is for the buck. I want people to be happy. And uh, how's it been with like employees and uh, shop space? Because you said you just moved now. Have you been in, uh, increasing the shop space or? Yeah, I, I don't have, I'm a little limited there, but yeah. So as we grow, it's been tougher to get employees that are, um, I, I've got a good crew right now, but it's always tough to find the right people to come in and, and have the right sort of dedication to, to product quality and everything. Um, I'm blessed that my daughter is, is one of the main employees and she's got, um, you know, after five years of doing this, she's really got her eye for quality on it. But, um, you know, finding employees is tough. We're out in the middle of nowhere and, you know, people don't want to commute out here. Um, so we so back when you and I first, go ahead. Back when you and I first talked, um, was it just you and your daughter working there? Cause I, that was the impression I had. Yeah. Yep. And we've, you know, we've, Hired local folks. We we hired a little kid, and then he he moved uh, moved out of the area, and now we've got uh, someone else local plus uh, plus a uh, uh, a retired gentleman that's that's coming by and learning how to make holsters and and contributing to the overall overall business, which is which is really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great. Um, so weird since, you but yeah, I mean, now, so we've got the, we've got the space and then, you know, we got the people now we've, now we're trying to, we're space, right? So it's a, you know, it's sort of about a 36 by, by 30 shop and it's, uh, we're pretty full. So weird since you are a heretic and only carry in a shoulder holster or in a pocket holster. Um, have you, how, what is your experience with the Codex? I don't think I've ever asked you that question. Um, very, very limited. Actually. I, uh, I had a cheap blade tech belt holster, just a paddle holster that I just grabbed just to get one. It was mostly, I just mostly used it as a range holster when I was going out to like places that weren't my club where I'd be tramping around a lot and not have like a dedicated shooting area, shooting bench sort of thing and uh the screws ended up falling out of it and got lost and i threw the thing in the trash so that's that's the full extent of my kydex <laughs> but i don't i don't use that as a judging Ky i mean kydex is wonderful stuff i just i just so, that this blade tech holster i lose literally one of the cheapest holsters i could find i wasn't looking for it to be my everyday carry holster or anything like that i just First times when I needed to carry on the belt, I wanted something to carry on the belt and I wasn't looking to spend a huge amount of money for it. What was it you were carrying in it? Uh, just a 1911. Okay. Yeah, we're just right? taking that he carried. Yes, it was a Kimber. Uh, no, no, it was a Smith & Wesson. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> I was going to say, you had a Kimber? I was ne about to make never so had a Kimber. <laughs> no, I've, 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 I've only had Smith & Wesson 1911s, which are Heretic 1911s in and themselves because they've got that external extractor and they've yep. got parts and they've got the, uh, 
the uh, the Schwartz safety. So so horrible heretic 1911s, but they're I, I love them. I do like that hybrid Smith and Wesson like 945. Have you seen that thing? Yeah, I've shot one. They're it's it's weird it's so it is that that's my big issue with it is it's so so weird is you know it's it's kind of sort of a third gen it's kind of sort of a 1911 you know it's got the third gen grip angle it even's got the weird like little circular so cutout on the though. slide where the where the uh, the slide mounted safety would be but then it's got a 1911 safety it's got a 1911 trigger it's got a 1911 beaver tail um, and I try, I don't try to remember what it takes for magazines, but yeah, it's, they're beautiful guns. I mean, they were, they were, I, I think they were only performance center guns. And so, you know, Smith and Wesson performance. The one I've always seen, around. the one I've always seen has the, the front half of it is blued and the back half is the polished flats and they're just left stainless. It well, looks I fantastic. I haven't seen those, but, uh, but yeah, they're, uh, yeah, it's it. The, it's just it's one of those. It's neither fish nor fowl, in my opinion. It's one of those like, all right, this is. I'll put it. In, this is. It'll be in of, the show notes. Yeah, it's it's kind of a you know it's 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 well executed, but it's not different enough to be. I'm trying to remember if the one I shot was like that. That is really sharp looking. I mean, they're they're pretty. I mean, it's got the Smith the Wesson third gen grip angle, which is just hideous. Um, and just, it's just, it's just too square. It's just, it's almost got that. Like, um, uh, what was that? 455 Webley automatic pistol. <laughs> it's almost oh, got uh, that the, the Webley semi-auto. Yeah. Yeah. It's got, it's, it's almost got that look about it. Um, it's like a T square. Yeah. Though, though in the hand, I did not notice any sort of, uh, you know, any sort of difference, you know, on, and of course it's got those like, you know, the, the Smith, the Wesson fish scale. Yeah, grip grip cuts, which I think are absolutely stunning. Um, but at the same right, time, well, I'll have to put like, that in the show notes. The the differences that it has from the nineteen eleven, like how similar it is to a nineteen eleven, as far as how it feels in the hand, makes the differences that it has from a nineteen eleven distracting. And People also, like, one one thing I'm in I'm in love with a nineteen eleven about, which is great about a nineteen eleven, is everyone makes a holster for it. Everyone makes parts for it. Um, you know, I screw myself a little bit with the external extractor on my Smith & Wesson because that is, that is a non-standard part, as w is the, uh, the firing pin block. But overall, everybody makes parts for it. You know, ev everyone makes holsters for it. Once you start getting off into the weeds with something, you know, kind of weird and rare like the 945, uh, you know, you might as well just spend the same amount of money and get a really tuned 1911. Everybody's probably like, what the hell gun are they talking about? Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they only made it. For I've, a short I've been, of time I've been browsing, time. I've been browsing and I'm now, I'm now like, Hey, I'm going to have to keep my eye open for one of those. <laughs> <laughs> they show up like. that's pretty cool i wonder i wonder how often they show up though i get i i, I would get to imagine there's there they're, that's one of those guns that when someone gets their hands on one they have one because they want one and they're not it's not a gun that they're going to trade away so like you're looking for like estate sales here yep so yeah, i know somebody, i have yeah somebody who just doesn't know what they got or you know accumulated it and trade somehow whatever yeah i agree so I had a lot of fun with the episode that you and I did, Shan, on the 9x23. So what has been going on with you in the 9x23? Speaking of weird, right? <laughs> yeah, the yeah the, the 9x23 and I have, uh, the, I still love the pistols, but they have, they have stayed in the safe for the most part. I actually, actually, you know what? I did loan out the, the Benny Hill 5-inch 9x23 pistol. And it, uh, it did, a guy took it and did local competitions with it. Uh, loved the pistol, wanted to buy it off of me. Uh, we never, we never ended up at agreeing on a price. So, uh, it's back in the safe and I may, I may put it up for sale again sometime, but it, I have not really shot the nine by 23 since we've talked. Oh man! So for people who don't know, what was that pistol? I I don't remember myself. Was it a 1911? 
It was a 2011. 2011. Built by Benny Hill, who's a three gun builder out of out of Texas. Uh, let's see here. I'll pull it out of the safe. It's uh, got a Caspian slide. It's got a SVI lower, and uh, yeah, I mean it's just a beautiful pistol. I took it. I took it, and I did three or four days of training in the mud uh, with this thing, and it performed flawlessly. Performed better than the Vox and M and P's, but uh, um, yeah, it's there. It sits. What's what's the capacity on that? <laughs> it was the joke when I was when we were doing the training because uh, most of the mags were 19, and I would I could get 20 or 21 in my uh, on the mags on the belt. Uh, so the, the joke was I never ran out when we were shooting at at the range. This was <laughs> this was a uh, Chris Costa class, and he was just flipping me crap about it. <laughs> Like, are you ever gonna run out of that, run out of rounds on that thing? Because some of the drills would be run them till it's dry. Oh man, you pack a lunch. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd walk up to the line with a hundred rounds. That's that, good, that's that, that is the great that's the great thing about the uh, the the double stack 1911s is just how, especially when they're in a nine millimeter caliber just how much ammo you can stuff in those things the thing is listen to this for, just from wikipedia so i don't know how accurate these things are but the, this is what we're going to go with right now 124 grain jacketed soft point winchester 1460 feet per second for 587 foot pounds of energy out of a nine millimeter cartridge nine by 23 but still nine millimeter yeah and guys the, reloading them can push them up 100 feet per second what was that you I mean, cut out a little bit i, I, I want to hear that for sure guys reloading have reported getting up to 1700 feet per second out of those my goodness that's humming I mean, that's that's 357 magnum all day long yeah absolutely yeah i've got I've, i'm actually looking at piles of 9 by 23 winchester factory rounds sitting here when i bought that pistol i ended up buying all the nine by 23 i could lay my hands on yeah it's really a reloading proposition <laughs> i've also got a bunch of uh a bunch of brass too brand new brass well, there you go so new works products um you have added a bunch of new stuff since we last talked yeah absolutely the uh you know we continue to do the custom work, which I can see is continuing to be a big part of our business. Um, you know, that's the origin outside the waistband and the inside the waistband minimalist and the bisect, which is the appendix carry um, rig. But since then, I've I've gotten really into this whole idea of 3D scanning pistols, hauling them into CAD designing the the holsters in CAD and then and then cutting molds on the CNC machine. So we've got something that we call the M2 and the M3 holsters. And uh, um, you know those have been been a lot of fun for us because we can really the idea is we can provide a lot more value to people, a lot more configuration, um, more more features such as the ability to adjust retention, more features such as build in the standard capability for people to run an RMR or a threaded barrel that would drop through, those sorts of things. And, and we can still keep the price pretty reasonable on these, so deliver a heck of a lot of value. So that's that's been a lot of fun for me because I get to play around with 3D scanners and CAD and CNC machines and stuff. But uh, I, I think it's really cool for our customers because somebody who wants to run it as a as a left-handed inside the waistband can do that. Somebody who wants to reconfigure something to run it outside the waistband uh, can do that. It's it's pretty fun. Also helps with like labor and everything because you can train people to do it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's the other thing is I can't. I 
you know, the custom side of the business it takes five years to get somebody really up to speed on it. I mean, that's how long it took my daughter to get there. Uh, here I can go ahead and I can train somebody in a, in a couple of weeks on how to, how to deliver something to the, to the right level of quality that our customers expect. Um, so how do you yeah, actually so it, do it? It helps. Uh, and it also helps us deliver them, deliver a, a lot more of them, right? So more people can use them. What are we going to ask? Uh, how do you actually do it? Um, you know, without giving away anything. Well, I do the, those, those style holsters. Yeah. Like the, the whole process. I mean, you have to scan it in you have your whole machine yeah, process so and then you actually. So we've got that, that 3d scanner. So we bring in, so what I would do for instance, and I, I still got to do it for, um, for one of the crimson traces that I have that I want to run on my pistol, but um, we would set up the pistol the way we want it. We run it through a 3D scanner, which gives us, uh, you know, kind of a 3D image of what the pistol and light is. We bring it into CAD, and then that's where we design in all the attachment points. That's where we design in the channel that the holster is going to slide through. That's where we design in the retention, all that, all that key stuff. And then we, and then, uh, we run it through some software that'll allow us to, to turn it into CNC machine code. And then we take it out into the shop and, and get cut in the mold on a CNC machine. And, uh, once we have the molds done and there's a couple of molds needed for each one, we get to uh, um, then we go test it out, and uh, we form we form the Kydex. It still uses Kydex. It's not injection molded. Um, we use a membraneless former, and uh, and it gets really good definition of the pistol and the, the holster and everything, and, and sucks down right over the mold. And then we uh, we cut it and finish it and uh, and test it out. So yeah, I mean, your holsters. I have one for my Sig Sauer and one for my Steyr with magazines, and also some for the car. And they're just extremely high quality. Some of the best holsters I've ever I've ever had. Um, well, I, I appreciate so that. And those were all those were all developed and delivered by way of the custom method, um, and the stuff that we we build for the the um, M2 and M3 style holsters, I think is even, even a cut above that. And that's actually what I've got on me right now is the, is the M2 style. And, uh, you know, it, it gives even better definition. It sucks around the pistol, the form of the pistol a lot more. And the snap, actually, I don't know if you can hear it. Let's see if you can. Oh, yeah. Loud and clear. That's my uh, my Glock 19 in my uh, appendix carry rig. You see the market going based upon your customer demand because you might be able to see it a little bit better than we can just knowing, you know, okay, people are ordering this or people are ordering that. Yeah. Well, I and I would love to hear what you guys have to say after after I let you know what I'm seeing, but uh you know what I see is that there's a lot of folks still want to carry inside the waistband. I am, I am not a huge inside the waistband fan personally. I think especially inside the waistband on the hip is for me a very uncomfortable position. I like outside the waistband, but I'm seeing a lot of inside the waistband demand. Um, there's less demand for the guys getting kind of the range setups. Most most of it's for guys that are doing concealed carry and, and for that, people seem to want to have inside the waistband. Although I, I will say, I think that a lot of people can carry outside the waistband and conceal quite well. But seeing a lot of inside demand, uh, appendix carry, uh, a lot of demand there. Um, I think that it's appendix carry is one of those positions where you tend to get the more experience using it because. I think rightly so, a lot of 
experienced folks would shy away from that. Um, and that's recommend for folks is unless they're really experienced, don't run appendix carry. Um, I think that customers continue to demand out of their suppliers uh, quality and uh, more features and and to keep costs low. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about the Kydex industry is that there's so many folks out doing it that people should be able to find what they're looking for in a in a good quality holster. Um, lights and lasers, they're getting getting to be smaller, less expensive. I think that there's a lot of a lot of really cool stuff out there that that uh, Enforce APL Compact Light has has taken off. I'm excited to see where the industry goes on that because, like I say, things keep getting smaller and smaller and less expensive. Um, I'm by the way, I'm a guy who carries a separate flashlight all the time, and I actually don't even have one. On, I don't even have a light or a laser on my pistol. Um, but things are getting small enough that I may I may revisit that decision. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, it used to be this huge thing, and now I've seen things that are I mean, incredibly small, like a thumb drive. Yeah, I I agree. And there's, there's more and more competitors out there that are, that are delivering stuff. Um, even the companies that are based out of China are starting to deliver things that I think, uh, I'm not running them. But I think that there are people there are people out there running some of the stuff out of China and having reasonable success with it. And frankly, if it's if it's getting people out there and getting them using it and and running with certain gear, I I don't have any problem with it. So weird. Do you have any questions? Oh, I'm trying to think of it. It's just there's so much uh, so much here. So I so I'm I just curious when you say. So after you've you've got your first first holster out using your uh, your your freshly made mold, you said you know you te you test it with a real gun. What are, what are some of the tests that you do? Uh, well, so if it's a newer design, I will run it. Um, and for me, running it maybe running it in a class or running it at the range, it may just be wearing it day in and day out for weeks on end. Um, but for the designs that are proven, which is kind of the space we're in now for the M2 and the M3 stuff, those designs, it tends to be that we test for retention. Um, how does it feel when that pistol goes into that holster? How does it feel when it comes out? Do we have the right degree of retention adjustability? That is, that is the, main, the main thing we're looking for when it comes to a, to a new design for a new pistol, not a completely new designed holster. Do you do you have a sweet spot, or do you go? It should you should be able to tighten it down till it's way too tight in that holster. There's no one who would reasonably want to draw a holster, draw a gun from the holster that's that in there that tight. And the this is this is not falling out, but it's a little too a little too less. Uh, less retained than, than I would ever want? Or do you, again, do you try to tailor it towards kind of a sweet spot? I, I try to I try to get it what I would carry right and then a little bit of adjustability around that. Mm -hmm. So we've been building holsters without adjustable retention for since we started in 2011. So we kind of know, hey, this feels good. This is the right amount of retention. It'll hold the pistol upside down uh, with a slight shake. Uh, it'll, you know, it'll release cleanly with a good firm tug, that sort of thing. So I am looking when it comes to adjustable retention. I'm looking for a small-ish band around that. Now, if I can get, if I can get a larger band, and actually, I, I've been making some adjustments to our designs where I can get a larger band of adjustability around that then great um but but i'm really just looking for that for that sweet spot and then yeah if i can if i if somebody can tighten it down so that it's um quite a bit harder to get out um closer to where i would think competition range might be 
where guys want to be able to run, 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 not have that pistol fall out ever at the range, um, then that's good. And if guys want to loosen it up for more of a static sort of sort of uh, competition, you know, without without doing a whole lot of movement, then then that makes me happy. But overall, you're fine that it's kind of like many things of the, oh, you give them, you know, all the colors of the rainbow to adjust it to, and they really go back to that very, very narrow range. I think so. I mean, that's where I, that's where I try to set it and ship it to is, Hey, this is, this is the, the sweet spot. And hopefully people, when they get it, they don't have to make much in the way of adjustment. So any, any future for uh, Kydex shoulder holsters? <laughs> Okay, Don Johnson. Well, those those Kydex straps become a little bit tough. Oh yeah, I can imagine that 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 would wear on you. Yeah, I we don't you know people have asked us we just don't do any webbing work we don't we don't build the that necessary webbing to to do the the shoulder holster work. Um, it's not now if you want to if you want to make something I could make the shell if you want to adapt it to your. Yeah. To your shoulder rig mm-hmm. don johnson don johnson you're gonna carry a bren 10 too um no <laughs> <laughs> no no that that that, well, that gun is not, not, not neither cool nor did it ever go well like just <laughs> even even if somebody ended up doing a successful run of the bren 10 which people keep promising and keep not doing I would, it would still just be such a bad taste in my mouth of how many hearts were broken by that weird little gun. Run one or two pistols. What's that? In your shoulder holster. You run one or two pistols in your shoulder holster. Uh, yeah, I run, I run a, uh, yes, a single, uh, single 1911 with a double mag carrier. Ah, okay. So you're not running one for each hand. Oh, you see, that would weird. be weird. Come on. I mean, I could, I could buy another holster body and, 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 and then <laughs> run one on each side. The only problem is I don't have two commander sized and a five inch 1911 and a horizontal shoulder holster would just, it, I, I would have a little nipple coming out of my back. You need your 357 LCR with the hottest rounds that you can carry. Oh man. Another holster. That'd be awesome. That would be <laughs> awesome. Oh, get it like a, cl- a little clamshell. So I could be like, uh, yeah, there you go. so I could be like Travis Bickle. Or a Steve McQueen bullet. Yep. Well, I uh, think that's about it. So with that, we'll head into the wrap-up section and close out the show. Don't forget to shop Brown Elves using our affiliate link. Head to firearmsradio.tv and click the affiliate link in the upper right-hand corner. Be sure to go like Handgun Radio and share it with your friends. And leave us a review on iTunes and listen to all the great shows on the Firearms Radio Network. Be sure to visit the Firearms Insider and be sure to check out the Firearms Radio Network on YouTube. And uh, Weird, where can people find you? You can find me at my blog, which is weirdworld.com. I'm also on the Score Report and the Gun Blog Variety Cast. And uh, Shan, thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, where can people find out more about Works Holsters and keep updated on new products and everything else? Uh, we are available on the web, works.com, W E R K and then uh, come and uh, people are always free to drop me a note or give me a call we've got all of our contact information up there uh, and uh, we'd love to hear from customers we really appreciate it and uh, thank you as always for everything you've done for us here on the show and uh, there will be links in the show notes to everything that we've talked about tonight so be sure to check that out hang on radio 186 so uh, weird. Thank you again for coming on. Oh, it's it, it's good to be on, and I uh, always enjoy the show. All right. So have a good night, Shane. Have a good night, Weird. And until next week, have fun and safe shooting. Thank you so much. <laughs>